Well, hello, everybody. It's good to see you guys, and thanks for getting together here with your church family. Always grateful that you do that, and I love connecting with you, and so thanks for being a part of, uh, of what's going on here at Grace. Uh, last weekend, I kind of updated you a little bit and let you know that there's kind of two things happening at Grace simultaneously right now. Uh, we continue to connect and reach people through this online format. And excited to do that. Those of you who are newer and been joining us, and those of you who are kind of being consistent in joining us here, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you're tied in and that you love what's going on here at Grace and you want to be a part of it. The other thing that's happening kind of simultaneously is that people are starting to come back to our live in-person ministries as well. And that number kind of gradually keeps increasing, which we're grateful for and excited about as well. Uh, we're going to stay in this kind of two-system format indefinitely. Uh, so what we're doing with you online and Discovery online and Life Groups online and Discipleship Groups online, that's going to be kind of a permanent part of our work here at Grace. And of course, we'll do the live setting as well. But in the live setting, what we've really found is we have a real need for more volunteers, and that's a good thing. Uh, some of us are, as we come back, uh, we need to fill in those spots where we can serve the folks who are coming in and out of the facilities live. So this is what I asked you last time we were together, and I wanna ask you again this time. Uh, if you were serving in the past and COVID-19 kind of interrupted that, if you are able or willing to volunteer again, we really could use your help. And if you would be willing to contact your, your uplink, your pastor director that's, that's above you and let them know that they can put you back in the schedule and you'd be willing to help out, I'd be really, really grateful for that. Uh, it might be that you were serving in an area that's not going to reopen soon. The example I used was our parking lot ministries. Uh, if you were on that parking team, we're not going to refire that team anytime soon. And so if you're in an area like that, if you'd be willing to volunteer in a different area, if you would let us know that, or if you've never volunteered before, but you'd be willing to pitch in in some different areas, we would really be grateful if we could talk to you because we really need the help. So for you guys, this is what I encourage you to do. Text keywords uh, serve at grace to 75787. Serve at grace to 75787. And let us know your availability. We'll let you know kind of the opportunities that are in front of us and we'll get that conversation rolling. And I'd be super grateful if you would take the time to do that. All right. Well, we started a new series last week and called The Gospel. And in this series, what I said was, I really think if you're, if you're tuning in to this conversation and you're trying to get your head around Jesus and what following him is all about, what that looks like, kind of what the Christian life is all about, this series is going to help you a ton with that. If you are a Christ follower, this series is going to deepen that for you. Or if you grew up in church, sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing. Uh, and you have some misconceptions or bad definitions about what the gospel is. Uh, this series is meant to help correct that. Now, I laid it out this way, just kind of a quick review as, as we talk about it, because it's so foundational what we're doing. I just said the gospel is this. Gospel is just a Greek word. It means good news or to announce good news. And in the Bible, that good news is all about Jesus and who he is and what he came to do and what he did and the relationship that he wants to have with us. And I, I said last week, if, if I was going to sum up the gospel like it, in one of the most concise ways possible from the Bible, I would go to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us the gospel is that God loves us. We know that because he demonstrated his love for us in that while we didn't care about God or why we were opposed to God or even why we didn't know about God, he still gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, to die for us so that we could receive God's love and then be able to give that back. And so the gospel is 
not just a contractual thing where I, I maybe I, I say a certain prayer or I interact with God in a certain way and that kind of gets me into heaven or I'm on the Jesus team as opposed to like a, a Muslim or a Buddhist or a, a Mormon or something like that, but I'm on the, the Christ team. It's not just a contractual thing where I do this and God does this. It's a relational thing. In fact, Somebody asked Jesus kind of about that and said, what, what is it that you want from us? And Jesus answered in this way. He says, what God wants is for you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. And so God looks and says, I don't just want your dutiful obligation. I don't want your legalism. I don't want your rule keeping. I don't even really want like your, your moral behavior. That's not the heart of it. What I want is I want you to know that I love you and I want you to love me in return. And it's not a contractual relationship, it's a relational context that the gospel presents itself in and it's what we wanna to respond to. So this is a big conversation, that's why we're hanging out in it for a few weeks. Encourage you, if you missed our last time together, maybe go back and watch that on any of our platforms or at least listen to the podcast and kind of come up to speed on the conversation. Uh, this weekend, what I wanna do is I, I wanna compare and contrast the true gospel of Jesus kind of against religion and the religion that has been presented in the name of Christ over all of, of time. And what is the difference between those two things and how should we Play out. I, I think one of the things that really confuses the gospel in, in our relationship with Christ is the, is the presentation of the gospel as it's come through religious constructs. And many of us grew up with, in, a, in a religious construct. The United States is, is still a, a pretty religious culture. It's pretty normal that people would go to church or embrace a higher power or a spirituality of some kind. So we're a religious culture. And so most of us have either been connected to a church or a religion, or we would at least have concepts and preconceived ideas and opinions about religion. And so I wanna talk about that because I think a lot of times the true gospel of Jesus, like the relational nature of Jesus is confused in that because we talk about it in a religious construct instead of a relational construct. Now, let me, let me kind of pause here for a second. I do not think that all religion is bad. I don't think that all organized religion is bad. I don't think it's all manipulative. I think there are many, many very well-intentioned people who function in a, in a, in a religious construct organized religion can kind of go two ways. It can kind of go down the ways of like do works, like do this, do this, do this, you go to heaven. That's contractual. Organized religion can also go down a relational path, right? So Heidi and I, we love our family and we organize those relationships. We plan Christmas, we decide to have a birthday party, we figure out the finances for the house. Those are relational organizations and religion can play out in both of those things. If the gospel is missing in either one, then we're not talking about the true message and the true heart of Jesus. So the gospel is the issue. It's not just the rails that it's on because those rails aren't all bad. They're not all good. They're not all bad. Some of them are just benign, but the message of Jesus has to come out and it has to play out in the way that Jesus would want it to play out, okay? So let's talk about this for a few minutes. What's the difference between the gospel and religion and how can those things be confused and maybe how can we bring a little bit of clarity with it? So let's, let's back up a little bit and kind of get above all of it for a second and let's just talk about why human beings are drawn to religion right? Why, why do we do that? What is it about a human being over all of time, all of cultures globally, 
why are there always kind of this desire to, to organize or to put ourselves in a religious structure? Well, that bottom line desire, that core desire is actually placed into us by God. God created humanity in his own image, the Bible says. And a part of what that means is this, that as a human being, I am created to worship something. Human beings have to satisfy the God question. We have to, or, or we can't navigate through life in a healthy way. We might satisfy that God question by becoming an atheist. And so we push all kinds of arguments and constructs and energy into talking ourselves out of the fact that there's a God. We might satisfy that God question by becoming a member of a cult where we go way into rules and way into legalism because we want to please or satisfy God. But we're the only part of creation and we're the only part of nature that does that. By the way, this is, this is uh, part of why there's an argument against this idea that we just evolved, uh, but rather we were created. Because no other part of the evolutionary process, if, if you lock into that, has worship in it. So fish don't worship, birds don't worship, cows don't worship, monkeys don't worship. Only human beings, there's something unique about us. And it's because we're created with souls and that soul has to be satisfied. We have to worship something. We have to satisfy the God question. Well, what happens to us in this, the Bible teaches, is that as a human being, being created in the image of God, I have to satisfy the God question. I'm going to worship something. But the Bible says I was actually created to worship the one true God who that we would often say created to worship Christ. So I was created to worship Jesus. It's Jesus who was given to satisfy my soul. Remember, he loves me and he demonstrated that. So I was created to be in that relationship with him. The gospel is the good news that God loves me and wants to connect with me. And it's the good news that he forgave my sins and allows me to connect with him. So when my sins are forgiven, it's not just that my ticket was punched to heaven. When my sins are forgiven, the barrier between a imperfect me and a perfect God is covered by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so I'm able to interact with God because my sins are forgiven. That will satisfy my need to worship. I can worship the one true God. That will satisfy the God question. I found what I've been looking for. I found the relationship with the one true God. But if I do not accept the gospel, if I don't accept that Jesus is who he says he is, and if I don't respond to his love for me, the way that he created or allows me to respond to me, that need to worship will go unsatisfied. And what I will do is I will plug something else in there. You go all the way back to the beginning of time, this is exactly what Adam and Eve were struggling with in Genesis chapter three, that the original temptation of man from Satan to Adam and Eve was this. Satan says, God knows that when you eat from it, from the tree, you will be, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the original temptation from Satan to Adam and Eve was this. He was saying to them, guys, you don't have to satisfy your soul by worshiping the one true God. You can be that God. Your soul can be satisfied from your own power from your own discretion, from, from whatever path you decide to go. In fact, you, you create your truth. You be you. And the reason that God can't be trusted is he doesn't want you to know that. There's something wrong with God. He's just a narcissist that he wants you to pay attention to him all the time. He doesn't love you. He's keeping something from you. And if you yield to this temptation and you displace Christ or God out of that place of worship, then you will be just like him. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They yielded to that temptation. They ate of the tree. Verse seven, chapter three, Genesis, when they did that, both of their eyes, the, the eyes of both of them were opened 
and they realized that they were naked, the Bible says. The Bible says that when they displaced God from his place of worship, kind of being the, the one true God, when they did that, they realized that their life wasn't satisfied anymore, that their soul was unsettled, that they weren't at peace, that life didn't add up the way that it did when they were connected and, con and, and, and pursuing God. And the Bible uses this idea of nakedness. They realize, oh my goodness, my life now is exposed. My life is incomplete. My life is insecure without, without being at this, at, without Christ being at the center of our hearts. And for the first time ever in their life, they felt unworthy. They felt ashamed and they felt unworthy of God's love and acceptance because they had altered their worship. They were created to know and be connected with God. He satisfied all of that. They decided, I don't want God to do that. I'm going to do that myself. And it left them in this vulnerable, exposed position. And the same thing is true of us. When we choose to place ourselves or anything in the place that Christ alone should be, in a different place that, 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 so that we're worshiping something else, Something else or someone else has our affection, has our heart, has our passion, has our time, has our energy. And we choose to put anything else in that primary place, that top shelf place than Christ, then we will go through the exact same thing that Adam and Eve did. We will feel exposed. We will feel incomplete. We will feel that, that we're, we're insecure because we're not in the place we were created to be and we'll feel shame and we'll feel unworthy of God's love and acceptance. Now, what we do when that happens is this. We have to satisfy that, right? We, we, can't, we can't handle going through life like that because we were created to worship and we were created to worship the one true God. If we're not gonna worship him, then we have to have something. There's a void in our life that has to be filled with something. And the, the, the heart of false worship or what the Bible calls idolatry is me trying to fill the place that was created for God in my life with someone or something that is not Christ. And it will always leave me feeling unworthy or unconnected to the heart and the mind of God. So we will try to achieve that worthiness. We'll try to do it by things like achievement. You know, I'm gonna make varsity. I'm gonna be the best in sports. I'm gonna be the best musician. I'm gonna get straight A's. I'm gonna be physically beautiful. I, I gotta be beautiful, I gotta be skinny, and I gotta have lots and lots of work done. You know, I, I gotta do all of that. I gotta be successful. I gotta, I gotta make the most money and drive the most car. Because if, if Christ isn't there to satisfy me, I'm searching for satisfaction. I've got to fill this void that is left there because I decided to push Christ out. We'll do that by what we would call in our culture like goodness, right? So we'll do lots of charity work. We'll do lots of kindness. We'll do lots of service because if I can just like prove that I'm a good person as opposed to a bad person, then I, I'll feel like that void is met. We'll do that, this is a big one right now in our culture, we'll do that through enlightenment. Like if I could just know more than you or be more understanding maybe than you are or my awareness is higher and my understanding is elevated and I am a very enlightened individual, see? I'll feel worthy, I'll feel secure, I'll feel good about myself if I think I can do that. Because if, if I'm not being given that worthiness by God, then I have to prove to myself and the people around me that I deserve it. I am worthy, see, I'm a great athlete. I am worthy of love and acceptance, see, I got straight A's. I, I'm worthy of love and acceptance, see, I'm the nicest person, the most gener generous person you ever met. 
I am worthy of love and acceptance because I understand and I empathize more than, than any other person does. And we'll spend our life doing that. We'll, we'll chase that our whole life because I need to prove to myself that I'm worthy and acceptable and I need of love and I need you to say that to me that I'm worthy and acceptable of love because I have to satisfy that question, right? Ready, ready, here we go. Religion, religion is just transferring our attempts to be worthy from secular efforts to spiritual efforts. That's all we're doing. Uh, I'm just taking the, the exact same mindset I'm going to be rich, I'm going to be famous, I'm going to be beautiful, I'm going to be young forever, I'm going to be smart, I'm going to be enlightened. I'm taking those exact same efforts and instead of pursuing them in like a, a secular way, a non-religious way, I'm just going to pursue them in a spiritual way, in a religious way, and I'm just transferring those efforts over. So instead of proving it to myself or proving it to you, I'm going to prove it to God. I'm going to prove to God. I, I'm going to achieve so much that God has to love and has to accept me. I, he has to deem me worthy. I'm going to go to church four times a week. I'm never going to miss mass. I'm never going to miss a confession. I'm going to always, I'm going to get baptized and have my kids baptized. I'm going to do the right things. I'm going to give the money. I, I'm going to prove to God, not to myself, not to you, but to God this time, that I am worthy of his love or affection. I'm going to, I'm going to try to be good. So I'm going to be good. I, he's, he, I'm such a good guy. How could God say no to me? I'm kind. I'm generous. I'm pure. I, I serve every weekend, right? I'm good. And surely God's going to look at my goodness and it's going to outweigh my badness. And that's going to make me worthy and acceptable to God. I can even go down the path of I'm enlightened. See, God, I'm enlightened. I know the Bible. I know it inside and out. I know the answer to all the Bible trivia questions. I've read the Bible through 15 times. I'm enlightened. I understand the Christian subculture. So I know how church works. I know how to have meaningless arguments with other Christians. I know how to do that stuff. And see, God, I'm enlightened. I understand what other people don't understand. Surely that makes me worthy and acceptable of your love and your affection. Right? And just like chasing, I'm just gonna call it secular things, success, money, pleasure, right? That, that is a, a bucket with a hole in the bottom. When, it, when do I ch achieve enough? And how come the more I achieve, the more stressed out I am about achieving? How come if I'm looking for love, through sexual experience, the more sexual experiences I have, the less I feel loved. How come if I'm enlightened, every time I'm enlightened, somebody else tells me there's another plane of enlightenment that I haven't achieved yet. It's a hole, it's a bucket with a hole in the bottom. It, it never ever satisfies that need for me. Religion will do the same thing. When, when am I good enough? When am I faithful enough? When am I disciplined enough? How does it ever end, see? Religion only produces pride and or guilt. It's the only thing it does. It, it will produce pride or it will produce guilt. I will e either feel self-righteous, look at what I did, and look at how I did it and look for how long I've done it. That's a pride. Or it will produce guilt. Look at how I failed. I wondered if I was acceptable to God, but then I blew it 15 times, and now I absolutely know that I'm not acceptable to God. See? It will only produce pride, or it will only produce guilt. And the outcome of all of that is always going to be some form of hypocrisy 
which is what most unbelieving people and most skeptics will make the biggest accusation against religion with. They'll say, well, you guys are a hypocrite because you're good at this, but you're not good at this. You're good at this. You're not good at the other thing. And it's a cycle that won't end. I thought of the Apostle Paul's writings here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And he says this. He says, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God, right? So I'm going to not be a wrongdoer. Tell me the right list of things to follow so that I'm not a wrongdoer, okay? So we'll start reading the list. Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, sweet, I haven't slept with anybody in several months now. That's not my wife or husband. And so I, I'm good there. I'm not a wrongdoer. Nor idolaters. Great. I don't worship like an idol. I don't worship the Buddha when, when I when, uh, and, and put stuff in front of that statue. I don't do that. Nor adulterers. Awesome. I haven't committed adultery. But, but Jesus says if I look lustfully at a woman in my, I commit adultery in my heart. So am I, a, did I wrong do, I'm not, nor men who have sex with other men. Oh, that's awesome because everybody knows that same-sex attraction is the worst sin, right? And then you go, nor, nor thieves, you ever stolen anything? Nor the greedy, do you tithe? Because the Bible says if you don't tithe, you're stealing from God, so you're a thief and you're greedy, a greeter, nor drunkards, you ever got a buzz on? N nor slanderers, you ever gossiped or badmouthed somebody or fired back on social media? Nor swindlers, you ever ripped somebody off? Will inherit the kingdom of God. And suddenly this is what happens. The outside world will look at people who are religious and say, wait a minute, you guys are cherry picking the list. You're, you're telling me that because I'm living with my, my girlfriend or my boyfriend that I'm going to go to hell, but I saw you get buzzed at the party. You're telling me that, that I, because I, I struggle with same sex attraction, that I'm going to go to hell, but you're on pornography all the time. Religion can only create this problem. It can only create guilt. It can only create pride. It can only create shame. It can only create self-righteousness. And it all winds up being some form of hypocrisy. And therefore, people who claim the name of Christ but they do it in the context of religion, often wind up discrediting the name of Christ. Now, the gospel is completely different than that. The gospel is completely different than, than a set of rules or cherry picking a list. The good news of the gospel is not that if you try really, 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 really hard, you can follow the rules. That's not the gospel. The good news of the gospel is you can't follow the rules. The reason that God gives you and tells you what sin is, is so that you realize that you need him. It's not to condemn you, we're already condemned. It's so that we pursue him. And the good news of the gospel is that a perfect God who knows that you are an imperfect person loves you in your imperfection. When God looks at these lists, he's like, these are all the things I'm helping you to know that you need me. But you getting your act together and you working really hard is not the solution. I'm the solution. Paul goes on, next verse, 11, and that's what some of you were, but you were washed in the gospel by Christ. He did that. I didn't do that. You were sanctified. You were, you were made, uh, you were set apart again, right? By Christ. I didn't do that. He did that. 
you were justified. Your sin of debt was paid by Christ. He paid a debt he didn't know because you owe a debt that you can't pay. You didn't do that. I didn't do that. Christ did that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. The gospel is not that if you keep these five rules, you won't go to hell. The gospel is you can't really keep any of the rules because you by nature are a sinner, but God loves you and wants to rescue you from hell. The, the gospel is the opposite of religion. Religion is contractual. The gospel is relational. Religion is you trying to make yourself not what you are or what you were. The gospel is embracing who Christ already says that you are. My child, an overcomer, someone who's forgiven, someone who's not under condemnation. Religion is trying to make yourself worthy of God. The gospel is the good news that your worthiness can only be found in Christ and it's a gift. All you gotta do is receive it. You don't have to and you can't earn it. Religion teaches that change comes from the outside in. If I discipline myself in all these ways, then I will change from the outside in. The gospel declares that change comes from the inside out. It's through Christ and by the spirit of God. Not through my willpower, not through my effort, not through who I am. In fact, the apostle Peter goes on and builds on this idea. He says this, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, we may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. What Peter is saying is this, as you grow in your knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, what is that knowledge? As I learn to love God with all my heart, soul, and mind and strength, as I learn about God's love for me, as I learn about God's mercy and I learn about God's grace and I learn about God's compassion and God's forgiveness and God's righteousness and God's justice, as I learn those things, I'm able to receive the love of God in a deeper and deeper way. And as I receive that love of God, his divine power gives me everything I need for a godly life. Religion would say, you got to muster that up on your own. You better get to church. You better get to mass. You better get yourself baptized. You better tithe. You better do all that. The gospel would say, it's all been done. All you have to do is receive it. And if you will receive it and embrace it, see, that is not information. That is not lifestyle choices. That is transformation. The love of God and the power of God changing us into who he called us to be. Religion pushes from the outside. Gospel pushes from the inside out. Now guys, this is where this gets hard and confusing because religion often looks like a relationship with God and a relationship with God is often presented in terms of religious activity. So what that starting point is, is life changing and important. I was thinking about it this way. You have two things that, that look uh, almost identical, right? So I have these two, two balloons, they look identical. On the outside, we're both going to church. Uh, we're both giving our dollars in order to help and serve people. 
We're kind to people. We're loving to people. We're generous with people. We're, we're, we're doing a lot of the same activities, religious people as well as gospel people. We're praying. We're singing. We're reading the Bible. We're involved in all of those things. But one of these things is driven with a desire to make ourselves worthy of God. The other one of these things is driven with a knowledge that God has made us worthy. One is religion and one is gospel, and it all depends on what it is filled with. A true relationship with God is empowering. It's joy giving, it's life giving, it, it asserts itself, it's transformative because of what the vessel is filled with. It's not what I'm doing, it's what is being done within me. And as I know God and love God and embrace relationship with God, my life is transformed, right? And it's changed and it moves me, see? Doing good things does not produce love, but love always alters my behavior. It makes me into something new. And it's not a burden and it's not crushing and it doesn't wear me out. It becomes the thing that drives my life in the most valuable part of who I am. Religion is this. I got to go to church. Oh, I forgot. Anybody get the tithe check? Oh, we're going to serve this weekend. Oh, man, I looked at it. Oh, gosh, I don't know if I should have said that. Oh, man. I... And it will collapse upon itself every time. And the world around us knows this, and you know it. It fascinates me when we read passages like John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus says, I have come to give you life and give you life to the fullest. When we read that passage, we tend to only think about that in the context of heaven. I've come to save you and give you a great life after you die. That's how we think of it. And that's because we think of the gospel that way. The gospel gets me into heaven and then I get that to pay off for a long, long time. But heaven is a continuation of the trajectory of my life on earth. Jesus is not saying, I'm going to save you and then get you to heaven, but you're just going to have to be miserable here. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, I've come to give you a relationship. And the relationship that we start here on earth is the same relationship that we're going to pursue for all of eternity. And that full life or abundant life isn't something in your future. It's something here and now. It's not the prosperity gospel nonsense where you get rich and famous and your hair grows back. It's not that nonsense. It's the meaningful things, just like a marriage, just like parenting, just like a friendship, where you would look and say there's ups and downs and there are ins and out, but these are the richest part of who I am and the richest part of what I do. Jesus would say, I want that with you. I love you. I want you. What do I want from you? I want you to love me back. Are there organized parts of that relationship? Sure there are. We organize birthday parties in our home. We organize a vacation together. We organize the finances. Heidi and I plan in order to get the kids through school and college. Sure there are organizational elements of it. But it's driven by the richness of the relationship not the burden and the obligation that we feel stuck in. The gospel gives life. It's exhausting trying to keep the balloon in the air and it's always gonna fall to the ground. But the gospel stands on its own. It gives life. And when life kind of pushes in on me, it's the gospel that rebuilds me. When, when life becomes heavy, it's the gospel that refreshes me. When, when life seems overwhelming, regardless of circumstances, it's the gospel that brings life back to that, see. And it's very, very different than a religion. And it's very, very central and critical in the point in our relationship with God. 
God cannot love you more and he will not love you less. And so as we follow him and as we respond to him, it's out of his love for us, see? Not out of duty, not out of obligation, not out of fear of losing our place in heaven, but out of his love for us, that we love him back. It doesn't mean everything will be hunky-dory, but it means that we will be transformed and the depth of our love with Christ will build a home together, a life together. And that will begin now and pursue through all of eternity. And the gospel is the invitation and the opportunity to create that relationship with God. Right. The next weekend, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you a prayer. And I'll, I'll lay the prayer out next weekend and then we'll, we'll walk through it kind of piece by piece so we can really dig at it. But this is a prayer that if you will start to pray, I think it'll be transformational to you. It'll just put your head in the right spot and it'll help your heart be in the right spot. And I'm excited to start walking you through that our next time together, right? Would you pray with me now? Jesus, help us. Help us to recognize and receive your, your love and help us to return that love back to you in deeper and deeper ways. The more we know you and the more we understand you, God, would you impact us in those ways? God, this simple little principle that it's not the outside in, it's the inside out. Would you somehow drill that home, embed that in us, Holy Spirit, so that we are certain and we understand that it's the pursuit of you that brings about the transformation of us. Do that now, even in these still moments, Jesus, in your name, amen.